any questions or assignments in particular you were thinking about? Um, I have one here open. Uh, you know what, let's, I don't want to deviate from the game plan that, that you had. Uh, let, let's work with, with what you got. I don't, I don't know when, um, when Jordan's going to be back from his vacation or anything like that. Um, I know he, he took some time off or so. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure. Leah was not well last week. I think I don't, I don't know if uh, yeah. uh, cause neither she or Jordan were, were in, in the class. Um, Jason was flying solo last night. Um, yeah. But, uh, um, you know, I'll um, I'm going to hang tight. But let's let's go with your game plan. You know, I'm following my teacher here. <laughs> okay. Now um, the objective is pretty much the same, regardless of of whatever path we take. The idea here is, to be honest, to raise the questions. Uh, something that might happen is that you're, you're working on it and there are things that you don't know that you don't know yet. That's the worst possible type of or category of things you know, or problems. When, when you are working on something and it never you know, crosses your mind that that particular question and it's going to, of course, come to hand you later, in the future and that's I don't know worse so if we can catch these issues early you're gonna start developing them and it's gonna make a better progress okay. so again raising the questions it's probably the the best possible uh, outcome of this tiny like small lesson even if we don't answer all of them at least the questions will be there and next class you know with Jason and the whole group you will be able to brock them up or, or start looking at those issues. But uh, now from a, from a, I don't know, with the understanding that they exist. I got you. I got you. Well, we've got other folks popping in now. And obviously, you know, um, I don't want to deviate from, from what's going on with the schedule since they're jumping in. So. Okay, good. Hello, Scott. Hello, Priya. We are Hi. just, uh, who can talking openly with uh, Don here. I'm gonna stop this so we can see all our faces. Um, I was actually going to start with a quick assignment that I had planned, but uh, it was just to break the ice. Priya or Scott, if you guys have something, any questions, we can kickstart this. I'm, I'm kind of just starting and I have no like real background in programming. I just, I've worked with programmers in the past a little bit. So I'm just working through the exercises and um, I guess, you know, just, I kind of want to be here and see like others work through their, you Good. know, questions and then that'll help me to bring out my yeah. own, you know? Yes. All right. Uh -huh. Let me then go back again and. And Priya, you're not alone in that. So I just want <laughs> Yeah, believe me, you're not alone. I'm, I'm leading the path, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> so this is a nice assignment. I'm going to try increasing the size of these things so you guys can. There you go. Um, and it's an interesting one. By the way, I'm just using REPL here because we don't need anything fancier than this. It's just a Python 3 REPL. And uh, this is an interesting assignment because it has the concept of while loops, okay? The idea is to build this double down function, right? That it's going to receive a, a, any number and a given times, right? You have to double that number. So um, we start, for example, with the number two, to put it in a, in a simple way. And we're going to kind of create our arguments here. These are our number. Let me start with a box first. Have this number. And we need to double it. For example, I don't know, three times, right? Actually, let me check the tests. Uh, three times, no, three times. Actually, let's start with the number one, yes. We, know, we need to double it only one time. So you take two and you double it, right? So this is gonna take it two. This is gonna be the first time we double it. And it, the result is, of course, four. That's what we would need to do. And that's actually what the tests are expressing. So here is, I don't know if you guys had the chance to catch those videos about function, functions uh, interfaces, but this is the, I would say this is one of the most important concepts in programming. It's 
the concept of an interface. We have this function that takes care of doing something and we are passing parameters to that function. We are saying, I need you to do, in this case, double a number and I'm giving what number and how many times I want it to double the number. And the body of this function is empty. This function is doing nothing yet, but I already know the answer. So that's why we can write the tests. And this combination of a tiny, concise explanation with examples, with the signature of the function, and by the signature, I mean the name of the function plus the parameters, plus the tests, you guys should start building this picture in your mind, right, of what you need to do. So when we, yeah, sorry, for oh, you. That's a great question. So the assert, um, like when I'm working through these um, exercises, the assert sometimes throws me off a little bit because I look at it and I'm like, does my code have to end up looking like this or, or, or is this the desired end I'm trying to re achieve? And, you know, like it is kind of a little, throws me off a little bit. Yep. So assert is, assert is a. It's like a this, testing thing, right? Yeah. It's uh -huh. a placeholder. Okay. And assert will always have, we will always have one thing here that we expect this thing to be true. So I assert that today is Tuesday. Okay. It's, it's like a fundamental truth in the universe. If this okay. doesn't apply, our code breaks and actually have uh, today is Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Assert that today is, Tuesday, is Tuesday. Very mm -hmm. good, equals Tuesday. Um, I'm gonna put a message here, all good cert working all right so i'm going to run this and we're going to see this message right here if i mm -hmm. change this thing and i run it again it's going to fail because it's expecting today to be tuesday but today is actually wednesday so there is something fundamentally wrong with our code assert is just that and it's it's fairly used when you guys will start the idea of us is to start giving you these concepts and slowly you're going to start picking them up and using them more often. This is highly used when you think about the contracts of your functions or modules. So for example, you are thinking about a function that it's called, I don't know, uh, def calculate profit from our company mm -hmm. and it receives all the sales of the year it receives all the expenses all the of the year taxes paid etc but you're gonna assert i mean it's like i say priya can you build this function and we're gonna agree on a couple of terms right conceptually speaking let's say i'm your project manager i ask you to build this thing we're gonna agree on a few requirements and you're gonna say what are sales? And I'm going to say, well, sales is a list of all the sales we were made, etc. So you're going to start doing something like for sale in sales. And you might say, what happens is a, like, and, and you're going to do something like, I don't know, um, total equals zero, sale plus equals, no, sorry, total plus equals sale, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, but uh, wait, what happens if this thing is negative, right? And you're going to say, no, Priya, let's agree on something. And let's sign a contract that is that no sale is going to be negative. Mm. That's going to be kind of a contract that we have, something that we have agreed upon. And mm. this is a good place to put, for example, well, assert that a sale is greater than, than zero. So basically it's saying given that a sale will never be less than zero, we can execute the rest of this. Is that one yes, way to look at it? Okay. Exactly. It's like this okay. fundamental condition that we need in order to proceed. And okay. you guys will find these, these, these things fairly often because as programmers, we need some solid ground, you know, to stand because if with, with too many edge cases, the code gets really complicated. So in this case, you're going to say, look, this thing works and it's kind of the contact, the contract is, this thing is going to work only if sales are always 
positive or zero, for example, we can also think about this. And I don't want to get into the, the actual example because it's not a great example, but it's a sort will let you, again, check these fundamental truths in your code. So talking about the assignments for us, mm -hmm. if your code is working, if your code is working and it's a big if, right? Mm -hmm. I know that if I invoke double down with two and I want you to double it only one time, the results it should can be four. Yeah, exactly. So, so before, that, so let's say I'm, I'm building something right in the real world. Um, and I, um, like I'm building this piece of code and I have to tell, like I have to tell it, like I want this in the end and then build this whole like program basically like build this whole function after telling it that I want this. You are, congratulations, you are describing a huge concept. Test driven, okay. Uh -huh. It's exactly that. It's thinking about the outcome of your code, of your software, uh -huh. of your application before you are even starting to write it. Okay. It's if you have to build a table uh -huh. or a chair, Mm -hmm. Will you will you start cutting the good before no. working on a good plan? You probably no, no. won't. So and this is the same thing. It's working out a good outcome. This is how this thing is going to look at the end. If I pass okay. two and one, I should get receive four. If I okay. pass three and three, I should receive 24. So you're working out a plan. And before you even start working on it, you already have in your mind the expected and the desired okay, output of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this makes sense. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the third and of all the tests that we've mm -hmm. written because we are two things is kind of a, uh, a two way uh, for it's, it's like it has two main advantages. The first one is that we can verify your code works period. If you run these tests, um, I'm going to run this thing, right? It's going to fail. because I don't have any code yet. So I can validate that your assignment works. And second, it's also a good, a good um, description for you in order to, to understand what the code is doing. Something else you guys will find with time with more complex assignments is that it's impossible to think, to, to provide a good human readable description. Words will not cut it when you start thinking about too many edge cases, especially in production, the, the, tomorrow when you're working in your professional life, words aren't enough. These tests are enough. You can write a hundred tests describing every possible edge case. Okay, you will receive one of these from your product manager or whoever, but then you will start thinking about these tests and I guarantee that you will always find edge cases that they haven't thought about. And you can come back and say, wait a minute, what happens if this thing, if you want to have a solid, robust product, you guys will always think about in, this, in terms of these tests. So edge case is basically something like how possibly this thing could fail in every possible way, making sure that the function doesn't have those shortcomings, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Pretty much. So um, why let's get started with these. Also important, you guys are starting to like, you're learning how to read errors since day one. Okay, so you're reading Python errors. You will spend your life running things. They will be failing and you'll be interpreting the, the issue that you had by writing these errors. In this case, the test is failing because it has you will read these part, these part, these tests in this following way. You have this first assert that has, we're gonna do, I'm gonna do here, it's gonna be pretty simple. Assert, it says assert here, trust me. Assert that um, these, I don't know, heart is equals to these box. These two things must be equal. But these things are kind of intermediate things. These are functions and they need to be resolved, right? This is double down. 
So immediately after, it's resolving the outcome of it and it's saying, wait, let's resolve the output of that. And the output of it, let me put here, return three. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna run the test again. The output of this thing was three. So again, it goes double down is not actually, I mean, double down is resolved to three. So immediately after it puts three here and here we always have the number four. I put a box, it should have put the number four. So that's kind of the resolve process that the assert is following. And at the end, it has this thing, which of course isn't true. Three is not equals to four, so the assert fails. Make sense? A function that has, that has no output, or, or sorry, that has no return statement, I'm gonna do print hello, for example. If I run this function right here, I'm not logged in. Give me a second. There you go. If I run this code, I'm gonna do double down with, uh, let's say, two on one, two on one. I will see some output. So it seems like this function is producing something, but what it's actually doing, it's printing, it's not returning. When a function is not returning, the outcome of this thing, even if we don't say it, is a non, is this non object. So this is the outcome of this function. So that's why when I run this thing, this thing, this function is gonna be resolved to none, right? And of course, none is different than four and that's why this thing fails. So for this um, function, right? It, um, like, is it dynamic? Cause this assert is like basically gonna fail if I don't give it the parameters two and one, right? So what if I give it like three and one? That's gonna return six, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So this assert is just one particular use case of oh, okay. this function. So okay. you're, I mean, actually you have several test cases with different okay. possible outcomes. And here, by the way, we have, we usually think about like two, three, four, Okay. You have infinite possibilities here. Where you can pass. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. So this is just one application and you can try other ones here, right? You can try other ones here just without the tests and then you mm -hmm. can run the tests to make sure mm -hmm. it works as expected. Okay, okay. Um, Santa? So, yeah, sorry. I throw this in real quick. So really, even though we have, um, we're looking at the first one and it says up there, you know, define double down and the first one is double down and it's you know parentheses two comma one really it's not looking for the answer to that what it's really the, the the test is is to create a function that will really answer all three of those not each one individually but it's it's a formula or a function that when we run the test we're just writing one thing up at the top that is really just the parameter that no matter what they're asking us, it will return the same thing. Is yes. that what? I mean, it's, yes, exactly. So this function should be generic and it should apply or it should work for every possible task here. And again, uh, you will always think problems or you will always try to tackle problems that are infinite, right? How many possible applications of double down you have infinite because you have infinite numbers can we write infinite tests we can't and of course we don't want so we think about a couple of use cases and again they the solution should be generic if i write a new test here and i put i don't know three one it should be six and it should work so yeah don the usually you start these tests will kind of be sorted or ordered, right, by complexity. The, the simplest ones are gonna be at the, at the top, but yes, the full picture of the function will be given by rating all different tests. One example, something we're missing here is what happens if, for example, this thing is zero, or what happens if this thing is minus one? In this case, there is, no, there is no test defined 
for that because the idea of this function is just to work on while loops. It's simple enough. Um, but again, this whole complete solution will, will, will be in place once you see all the tests and you understand all of them. And sometimes something might happen is that you will fix the function for one particular case. So let me make this test pass. Done. I'm cheating, but I'm making it pass. There you go. This thing is expecting a four. I gave the four, period. But of course, it's going to break here, right? So sometimes without, you know, being so um, obvious, right? Sometimes you will make the function pass, but for one test, but not for the second one. And that's when you have to think, what's that generic change that you have to make that's going to make both tests pass? And that's the problem that I was having with a lot of last week's assignments, dealing with lists and joining the lists and, and, and things like that as, as some of the other things. So, uh, okay. So um, again, and kind of, uh, let me clean this thing up. We're gonna, let's tackle really quickly this, this one assignment about uh, double down. So we, we can close the while loops part and then we're gonna do something with collections. Um, the, and again, focusing on the core of the assignment, you receive a number and the outcome of that assignment, the, the function is going to be that number, sorry, this number, double this number of times, right? So for another use case, let's think about another use case. And here we can use the second test, three double three times. So we're going to do use three double three times uh, right here. You're gonna start the first time, it's gonna be this first time, it's gonna be uh, three times three is nine, right? I don't remember, three times, three times two, sorry. Is it doubling? Yes, it's six, my bad. Uh, yes, so we're doubling the number, I was gonna actually do it to the power of. So, it's doubling the number, a given number of times. So this is times two, right? The second time, second time is this thing times two again. That's gonna give you 12. And the third time is this thing times two again. So it's always doubling it. And here we have 24, right? That's pretty much what this thing is expected. Make sense? It does make sense. I'll be honest with you. The first time I saw that equation up there, I went to the exact same thing that you were thinking. It was, you know, three to the power of three, you know, yeah. and, you know and, and I was coming up. That's not the correct answer though. I mean, you know, in that regard. Yeah. yeah. This, this number was too small for, for that. Um, so to work this assignment, I'm going to start it here is I'm gonna give you guys the full idea of while loops, even if it's a little bit boring for now, but it's the way that I kind of understood the, the whole looping procedure when I saw this. And it's not looping at all. Making, it's, there is a phrase sometimes with software development that is start with things that don't scale, right? Start with things that are just manual, stupid solutions that you see that they don't scale, but they will let you first paint the whole picture and then you're gonna improve them. That's the, gonna be the second iteration. So given a number, three for example, and a given number of times, let's do another one here. We're gonna put here four to do a different test. So it's gonna be one more time times two. It's gonna be 48, right? Given this number and given number of times that we want to double it, four, we need to end up with this solution. So the manual process, again, it's not a while loop. It doesn't scale, but it, it will let us just think about the process. Is, I'm going to use here a separation, number, I'm going to do times equals two. I'm going to print number, right? This is gonna be time one, or first, yeah, iteration one. And I print it, we have six. If I repeat this thing and I copy and paste it, sorry, if 
I copy and paste it several times. It won't under the same answer. So four, three, two, I will end up with the given solution. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is understanding the manual process that is required. So then I can see that this is of course repeated and I can then use a more um, scalable or a more efficient solution, which is of course the dynamic one, the while loop. Um, there is a, a video where we introduce this imaginary structure that doesn't exist. So I want you guys not to, to uh, get high hopes on it, but uh, it's like, if I could do something like repeat four times this process, right? If I could do that, the end result could be what I'm expecting, right? I have this block four times. So if I could repeat this block four times, that's it. Of course, it doesn't exist. So we have to work with, with, with what we know already, which is, for example, the while loop. The while loop is relatively simple in concept. It's hard to put it in practice because it has, as you guys know, so many you know, uh, sharp points. In this case, it's gonna be a while loop is while a given condition is true, I'm gonna repeat a body. So we know that we have to repeat this body. I'm gonna leave it right here. While a given condition applies. And the condition might be that we haven't repeated four times yet. So while, let's say how many times, uh, how many already, right? Zero, for example. So as, as long as how many already is less than times, I'm gonna keep doing this thing. Make sense? And of course here, I will have to do something like um, how many already plus equals one. So I increment it by one. And the condition is gonna be something like while how many already is less than times. And hopefully I'm not getting into an infinite loop or anything. There you go. This thing works in the same way. Make sense, questions? You guys are yeah i'm I'm pretty sure i'm I'm saying it basically because you you've you you stipulate at the top that the number is going to be used is three, and you've also said that times is four, so you've set the parameter yep. and then the while loop basically tells us how many times already it starts with zero, and then every time it runs it through the while loop, it will tack on one to how many number how many already yep. and once it's achieved the total it, it, once it it achieves the point of the loop that it does not pass four times, then it, I take it, it prints out everything. Or each time it does, it will print out the number once it's gone through its loop. Yep. Um, one tool that might be useful here for, for these loop-based constructs is the Python, Python Tutor site that lets you visualize the execution of your code. Uh, so it's a... Yeah, so this one is gonna be, you can kind of visualize it step by step, right? So a couple of steps, we're setting the parameters, we're setting the parameters, there you go. And here's when kind of the while loop starts. So the first step is checking, is how many times less than times? How many times is zero, oh, how many already, sorry. How many already is zero times is four? Is it less than times? Of course, zero is less than four, so it moves forward and it executes this thing. Num is now six, we print num, and we increment how many already, and we go back again to the top. Is still how many already less than times? How many already is one, times is four? Yes, that's a, a true condition, so it keeps moving forward until, I'm gonna fast forward here, we print 48, until how many already becomes four. Is four less than four? No, they are the same. It's not less than. 
So this thing is now gonna exit and quit. Santa, I got a question for you. Yeah. Why is it that when it runs through the loop and it goes back to numbers times equal to two, it doesn't keep repeatedly just printing six? Well, how, how, because I'm not seeing where the mathematical function is where it takes it, where it's changed the original number of three into the new number that's the calculation. You understand? It this one right here. This line. Oh. This line right here is the one changing it. And actually, let's go back to the, to the beginning. Number starts as three times how many already. And now when I hit this line, I'm going to hit forward now. And you're going to see this change. Focus your, your attention here. I'm going to hit forward. And that's when this number thing is changing. So back, number times equals two. It's modifying it. And it's, uh, let me comment this whole block out All right so you have you have a, a given variable two you're going to do a uh, print you can and you want you want to multiply this thing by three one option is doing x is equals to x whatever it was times three print x let me run it there you go but there is a shortcut in python which is the times equals three. These two things are the same. Just that. Guys, make sense? Questions? I got a question. You are recording tonight, right? Because I want to make sure I get to rewatch this over again. Okay. Yep, yep. I'll record. So, um, next step is, of course, turning this thing into a function I was using print, so we have a better b visual cue, but I, wanna, I want you guys to kind of stop printing as soon as possible and start returning things, actually producing values. Um, so if we wrap this whole thing in a function, I'm gonna do def double down, uh, number and times are parameters that we're receiving, right? So when I invoke this function, Result is going to be double down uh, three, was it? Four times and print the result. So here's when we want to see that. And of course, here, what we're going to do is we're going to loop these number of times and then we're going to be done. This thing is going to be over this, this while loop. And that's when this function has its final result. It has done this thing a given number of times and now, now it's going to be the final one. So here I can return num, right? I'm going to comment this one out. I'm going to run it. There you go. We have our final number right there. Get rid of this one. So again, the logic was there. There is a little bit of, um, I don't know, plumbing, right? To put it in the true way that a Python function should be expressed without prints and returning values. Remember, the difference between returning and printing is huge. If I ask you guys to do something, I ask you guys to bake a cake for me, I always use the same example, Don has already heard about it, if it is for Priya and for Scott. Um, if, you, if I ask you guys to bake a cake for me, it's my birthday, I want you to bake a cake, the outcome, the result is the cake. I am asking you to do something, that's the function, right? I'm giving you a task. The result that you're returning, returning is the cake. I am receiving that value back. If you print it, you're showing the, the thing, but you're never returning it to me. So I cannot use it. This is the same example. If we print it, we see it in the screen, that's fine. It's like showing you your cake and throwing it right out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's as sad as that. So that's the important difference between return and prints. That's the important difference about it. As a rule of thumb, you guys should never have print statements inside your functions. Always have your print statement outside. If you want to see, it's fine to debug your code with print statements because again we do need this visual idea of what's happening 
but always keep your print statements out. Try to at least. All right, um, let me go to a list assignment. Uh, I think we had, I think, oh, no, no, sorry. Let's first see if this code works. There you go, worked. And I think these one, I now I forgot which one I was trying to use. What happened with these? I know the one there that says get third element was one that I think was, was tripping me up. Get third element, this one. There you go. Um, So this, I think, might be more, I don't know, more complicated than what it should, right? So you have a list, uh, A, B, C, D, E. And a list, in this case, it has uh, five elements, but remember that the lists are indexed by starting with zeros. So it's zero, element zero, element one, two, three, four, if you want to get the third element, in this case is the, 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 the letter C, right? You want to print this thing, it's going to be L at two, which is not, right? So these one might be expressed a little bit more complicated than what it actually is, because the truth here is that this thing is just two, I think. There you go. It's just as simple as that. Um, the idea is to go work with these indexes. Remember that you can also have negative indexes. So I'm actually thinking about another assignment idea after this one, um, that giving a list of elements is given the so right here remember you guys have two different indices one is the positive starting from zero one and there is a kind of a redundant one which is the negative one i'm gonna put a negative sign here that it's minus uh five minus four minus three minus two minus one so the same element C can be accessed as L at two or L at minus three. It's an alias. Sometimes you guys wanna access your elements starting from the beginning. Sometimes you wanna access them starting from the end. So if you wanna get the last element of a list, right, the last one, in this case is four or minus one. But if in this case is four, we can put a four here because we know up front that this list has five elements. If we don't know the length of the list, we will have to do something a little bit more ugly, that it's the length of the list minus one, right? So that's why these negative indexes are sometimes useful. It's if you wanna get the second to last, Right, you can have to do something like that when it's actually just, oh no, what did it do? Oh, there it is. No. Make sense? Um, so let's see what else. I think this one was the one that I want to cover. I should have open both. Yes, there you go. So um, this is a nice one because it's also, it's also involving the concept of repetitions. And the idea is that we are starting with a list of elements and we're just transforming the, a list to a tuple. We're using a different structure. It's, it's kind of the same, they are the same elements, they are just contained with a different structure, in this case, with a tuple. So this is a fairly 
good uh, understanding and idea of how collections kind of worked together. So, um, so under the big category of collection, there's a su two subcategories of lists and tuples. And yes. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. And lists lists carry only like strings or only integers like that, or is it that tuples can only carry a variety of information? Because from yesterday's class, um, Jason said that um, tuples cannot be altered um, or, you know, like appended yep. to, I mean, I'm, and they just can't be changed basically. Yep. And, but, um, so what is like the main difference between a list and tuple? Let me start with your previous question. Okay, okay, sorry, uh, this is a whole idea. Any, any collection in Python uh -huh. will accept any different type of value you can provide. Okay. They are heterogeneous collections and you can pass anything, you can store anything in a list. And when I okay. say anything, you guys will start seeing the boundaries of this later. You can even put modules, classes, objects, mm -hmm. files, it's a pretty flexible, every, every collection in Python is flexible. Lists, tuples, dictionaries, sets, as you guys were going to see later, they are flexible. You can put anything in there. From mm -hmm. collections, you're going to have some collections that are sequential, sequential, usually represented this way. Um, mm -hmm. And sequential means an ordered structure. A is before B, which is before C, which is before D, etc. It's a sequential structure. Mm -hmm. And here we're going to have two kind of important categories or, or uh, two traits that are differentiating these collections. And one is going to be a mutable structure and another one is going to be an immutable structure. And this is going to be your list or your tuples. The only difference, I'd say, between a list and a tuple is what you said. A tuple cannot be changed once it's created. A list can indeed be changed. It is mutable. You can mutate it after it's created. That's the only difference. Okay, but a list can also, like, let's say I, like, built this website or whatever, and I'm collecting user data, yep. like, what's your email, all this stuff. That can be stored in a list or in a tuple, both? Um, it can be, but not ideally. Yes, exactly. So if you okay. have users and uh -huh. you put them in a tuple, right? You have Mary and Joe, right? And you have a new user, which mm -hmm. is Tom, you can't append to this tuple. There is no way of appending it. So the operation is a little bit more complicated what you'd be doing is something like users is actually now uh, what users, the previous ones, plus, and I'm, I'm, these might be confusing. I'm just showing you guys the, the usage of it or the end result. So there you go. Now you have all the users and this is again confusing. But, but that's uh, pretty inefficient because each and every one you'll have to like, you're yeah. creating a new one. And, yeah. and here's, aside from the technical terms, is how important it is to pick the right collection. If we were using a list instead of a tuple here, right, this whole thing became something like users.append new user, period. You know, readable, mm -hmm. simple, and, and just picking the right collection can save you a lot of time and it can make okay. like a more readable code. So then like, let's say I, um, for the sake of gathering the data of these customers, I have it as a list format, right? So it's easy to add a new user. But then like from the class yesterday, um, I didn't have a full understanding, but like Jason was saying how when you're analyzing certain data, you don't want it to be um, a list, right? You could mess it up. So can a list be transformed into a tuple for the sake yes. of, you know? Um, yeah, sometimes it can. Uh -huh. Usually, if you are in charge of your code and you're writing your own code, you will not try to change things. So uh -huh. you will try to give, and this is kind of a concept from our second module. We talk about functional programming. And uh -huh. especially for, for those of you that are working with data science, it's really important not to modify data. 
actually pandas is an immutable library per se so um usually you don't need to make the change to a tuple although you might want to do it if you're not sure about the code so i don't know i'm using your function you left the company two years ago and i'm using your function i'm not sure what well, about what you're doing you know mm -hmm. maybe i can turn it into a, into a tuple first so i'm sure the nobody's going to modify it but okay. again it's, it's kind of an unusual okay problem. but it's possible that like they can in, like intertwine with i mean intertwine means like a tuple can become a list or vice versa whatever yes yeah uh -huh. exactly. okay um, so this code, if we want to turn this list into a tuple, it might be difficult to do it with kind of a for loop if you guys are thinking. So here, the only thing we're doing is changing the container, right? We have, a, we have a two containers, a red container, and we have a, a green container, right? So we're just, and we have a couple of objects in this one object one object two object three object four and what we're doing is just taking the objects to a different container that's it so you might think about this thing as a sequential step-by-step -step process like four element in list i'm gonna store it in tuple which this doesn't exist by the way um so we're moving one element at a time but again, tuples are difficult to change. It's not that I can create an empty tuple. And then add to it. Right, exactly. So I'm gonna create an empty tuple. I can't do empty tuple that append, right, this element because tuples are again immutable. If I try to do that, it's breaking. So sorry about it. Let me give you the solution for this. It's just invoking uh, L as tuple is doing tuple of L, period. L as tuple is dot. Okay. So these constructor, you know, these, this function, if you put it right there in this way, it's an empty tuple. If you put it in this way, is taking each one of these elements and transforming it. So, you know, this code, gets extremely simple. But that original list is still in existence. You can go back to that original list, yes. even though you you, yes. you you basically repackage it as a tuple. Yep, I'm gonna return this thing. Forgot to return. Uh, no, no, you don't need to repackage it. It's still, let me print, oh, just keyboard shortcut L. It's still the previous one. We've never modified it. Again, this is an immutable solution. The tuple is created with a copy, with a copy of all the objects. And this is kind of a this is kind of a really good representation, by the way, because the new instance has a copy of each one of them. So you can either use the list or the tuple, whatever you want. We're actually seeing both here: the tuple, sorry, the tuple and the list, the list. But they are we're not changing anything. Both are unchanged. And if we append the original list L, let's say we add in the, the, the characters of F, G, and H, will that automatically update the tuple or uh, we will have to add them separately to the tuple? Mm, that's a good question. Good question. And as usual, I can recommend you guys just to run it and say it by your own. The tuple was created is this new structure that was created with a copy of the elements that it that existed when we created at the moment that we created the tuple. So after that, everything you've done, right? This is a new. This, these elements are new. They are they weren't there when you created the tuple. So what if you like, like if you go back to the code? Yep. The, uh, so what if you took um, line ten, right, and then you um, like ran it after the L dot append H would, would that like update the tuple? Like after that, after that line, if yep. you, if you did line 10, would it like yep. update? Oh, it's actually creating a new one in this okay. case. Okay. I'm going to do it again. What this step would be doing okay. go, is killing this collection, creating a new one, creating okay. a new tuple. And now, yes, it's copying over 
all the elements, including uh, the new ones, five, six. So now it's copying all the elements again. So it doesn't store versions, it just creates a new one. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Um, guys, I gotta run, because I have another class in a few minutes. Any questions? How, was this useful? Can we repeat it on Thursday? Do you guys think it's useful? Yeah, I, I'll try and be here on Thursday. Um, oh, you have classes done, right? I'm going to record it anyways. Right, yeah. And that's, yeah, and that was my question before you go. I know you got to leave. Uh, how, are you gonna, how are we going to access tonight's uh, video? I'm going to send it through Slack right away when it's ready. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you taking the time before your class and things stop with us. Yeah, thank no you. No problem. Um, if you guys have questions, remember Jason is still available. So mentor hours are, you know, now going, you can hit on him, even though mm. <laughs> he's a cool, dry guy or don't, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit. A little bit. All right. Okay. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Thank you. See you later. Thank Goodbye. you, Santiago. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.